Data democracy is something you have all heard. Most companies want to democratize their data, but very few have actually executed on this vision. Missing the mark will land you in the realm of data chaos. This session will explore what data democracy means at Grammarly and best practices for taking a similar approach. My name is Chris Lachlan, and I am the engineering manager for the data platform team here at Grammarly. Our mission is to enable all of Grammarly to do more with data. We ingest, process, and surface billions of events every day. This is an industry, company size, and role agnostic talk that will show you Grammarly's approach to scaling and democratizing data. In this talk, I will go over the branches of data governance and then focus on two of the core responsibilities of a data platform team that aspires to achieve data democracy. Let's start with the branches of data governance. Here in the United States, our democracy has three branches of government. The legislative branch makes the laws, the judicial branch interprets the laws, and the executive branch serves the needs of the people by carrying out those laws. The branches of data governance are very similar. Executives and directors create company policy. Data security interprets those policies. And in collaboration with those branches, data platforms serves the data needs of the company. This is a very important separation of power when striving to achieve data democracy. It is crucial that executives and directors create the company policies concerning data security and data privacy. Data security then identifies the risks and vulnerabilities within the company. And this frees up data platforms to simply apply those policies to various business asks. A company's data needs will vary, but in general, asks will fall into one of three categories. Category one is, I need access to sensitive data. You can see some examples here in red. Data platforms should not have to decide which of these asks is acceptable. They should be able to refer to your company policies to know what is allowed and what is not. For asks that are permitted, data platforms should find secure ways to meet the needs of the business. Category two is, I need access to data that is not readily available. This is usually data contained in a CRM or an advertising platform and generally won't go against any company policies. Finally, category three is I need access to very large amounts of data. Asks like, I need three plus years of data. These generally won't go against your company policies either, but do pose different challenges. Tackling these asks is where we get into the responsibilities of data platform teams. Data platform teams have many responsibilities. I'm gonna focus on two core responsibilities as they are crucial to achieving data democracy. Those two responsibilities are access control and data availability. RBAC or role-based access control allows us to assign permissions that align with the needs of each individual within the organization. Data availability covers what data should look like in a democratic world. Role-based access control is a great way to make a wealth of data available without compromising your company policies. It relies on a concept called the principle of least privilege, which can be summarized by these two bullets. One, an individual's function rather than their identity dictates their access. And two, if that function does not require access, it will not be granted. Grammarly takes this concept one step further. In addition to gating access for our internal users, we also gate access for our internal applications. You're either a service, which is a data producer, like a CRM or a data warehouse, or you're part of a group. A group is simply a role, like marketing analytics, or a group of roles, like all of engineering. Let's talk first about services. Services have access to infrastructure, but only the infrastructure they need in order to surface their data. If they don't need access, they don't have it. A service creates and owns tables that groups can sometimes query. It is their responsibility to define service level agreements, also known as SLAs, and maintain data quality in their tables. Let's take a look at our application of this. Service cluster policies govern the access to infrastructure. Here in the Databricks UI, which is the platform we use for our centralized data hub, you can see a couple of service policies. 
I can see them because I'm an admin, but only owners of a service can actually use the policies. For the engineers watching, here's the portion of the Terraform setup that generates the IAM roles, policy, and instance profile, both in AWS and Databricks. Here you can see the Terraform that automatically creates an S3 bucket for the service to use. This bucket is used for all of the services data and is the only place services can write. Finally, we attach table access for groups. Data created by services can be provisioned at the schema level to groups or to custom collections of groups. Here you can see that the data platform service has split its data into default and restricted finance. Here, the tables are split into those two schema. So if you looked at the restricted finance scheme at the bottom, you will see that all of our billing events are mapped there. Finally, we attach table access for groups. In this case, everyone gets access to default and the engineering groups get access to restricted finance. One question you might have is, how could data platforms be a group and a service? This is actually possible. Teams can act as both services and groups. Data platforms surfaces our product events data, but also queries data. As a result, they have both a service instance profile and a group instance profile. Our team must pick one or the other when completing a task. If an engineer on the data platform team chooses to be a group, they will not have access to infrastructure. As a matter of fact, no group has access to infrastructure. Group access is contained to table, tables provided by services. Let's take a look at how we do this. First, we create group based, groups based on company ACL, access control lists. For us, this is simply functions within Grammarly. Then we create access-based parent groups. These will allow us to elevate permissions manually for functions needing to perform a specific task. Once that task is completed, we can easily revoke that access. And finally, we create group policies which govern everything, including cluster, cluster configuration. In some cases, we do not even give teams access to clusters. Instead, we give them a contained environment inside of a SQL and analytics space. In this space, they can only write SQL. We are also able to provision environments in which users can only write Python or Scala. We use Terraform modules to create all of this, but here you can see the cluster configuration portion of this code. In line 33, you can see how easy it is for us to define custom policies with group specific overrides. So now it's time to connect all the dots. Here's how all of this ties together. At the highest level, services can block access to all of their data by not granting access to their S3 bucket. In the default and restricted finance example, you also saw how services can allow access on a table level. These controls even work on admin users. So in this example, you can see that I have not been given access to security hub data. Column level access control is also possible using the access-based parent groups, just like this. What we're doing here is saying that in order to view the data stored in this column, you must be a member of the access restricted PII parent group. So when a user's task requires this data, we can provision the access and easily revoke it when their task is completed. So now that we've covered access control, let's move on to data availability. Availability. It boils down to this, focus on your company's most common queries. Parse all of the data so that it's available, but then really focus on making 85% of the data points executives request super easy to retrieve. Let's start by talking about parsing logs. Databricks has a Spark engine, so we are able to take advantage of structured streaming. We set a checkpoint so that our stream knows what data it has processed already. This prevents data duplication, but also limits latency. As soon as a new batch of data arrives, the stream will begin processing it. We then dynamically access the schema of each batch of data rather than hard coding in which values to parse. Generally, 
what you'll see is people defining the schema of the data and pulling specific columns from that schema. The limitation of that is that new columns are not picked up. If logs are sent with new values, you will not capture it in your new table, in your table. But we pull all of the columns. We set merge schema to true so that when new columns appear, they will be added to our table automatically. And we're done. After the data is processed, we put the most common data sets in our default schema. These are automatically accessible by all users. You can see we denote dimension tables with dim underscore prefix and explicitly tell users which events are parsed in our events log tables. Even new users should be able to quickly identify where data lives. So let's test that. Which table would you use if I asked you to answer this business question? How many times have our products been pinged since 2018? Hopefully you all found it. We're gonna use events underscore ping. I said before, these questions should be easily answered. Nine lines of code with generous spacing, it's not so bad. Since we know what queries are going to hit this table, we can optimize for them. So these queries should run fast. Databricks lets you draw pretty graphs if that's what you want, but you can see that this query ran in less than two seconds. Parsing all columns and streaming them into a table can produce really large tables. We can further optimize by aggregating the time dimension and removing some of the less important, highly granular columns. Let's use our text check table as an example. It is currently at the timestamp level, which is denoted by the column event TS for timestamp. It also has many granular columns like nonce that are not very useful to end users. As a result, it has 160 columns and is over 41 terabytes in size. We aggregate it to the day, event TS is converted to event DT for date, and we remove a bunch of less important but highly granular columns. On the previous slide you saw, we had 160 columns, and now you can see that we're down to 73. As a result, we drastically reduce the size and by extension query time, which translates directly to cost savings. And there you have it. Data democracy is possible. Taking a similar approach with access control and data availability will start you down the path. I would like to make a special thank you to Michael Mager and Daria Ivanova for all the work they did to put this deck together. I would also like to thank Afrotech for inviting me and for all their contributions to the Black and tech community. I would also like to give a shout out to my team they're constantly doing so much innovative work. And last but not least, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Now head over to our careers page and join us, or at least go sign up for a Grammarly account. Thank you.